Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillah walhamdulillah wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Uh, welcome to all the viewers wherever you are from New Zealand, from the UK, from Philippines and from Singapore, from Malaysia, wherever you are. So welcome to our program today inshallah. Uh, today we are blessed we have a uh, well-known um, vaccinologist uh, Pro Associate Professor Dr. Helen Petrosis Harris. So, inshallah, we will have a very good discussion. We'll have a very important discussion. And we would like to have a very serious discussion, uh, especially for us in New Zealand, because in New Zealand, we need to reach our target. We need to get the lockdown ends, inshallah. And so, and for those who have many, many questions, I've received a few questions, inshallah, and then we'll start, there, inshallah. But before that, I'll get um, Dr. Helen. Can you please just introduce yourself a little bit? Sure. Uh, so, so I'm a, a vaccinologist at the University of Auckland, and I've been involved in uh, in vaccines for about the last uh, 23 years. And my areas of interest are vaccine safety and vaccine effectiveness. So at the moment, uh, I'm co-leading uh, some studies that involve a, a program of work that involves more than 18 countries across the world. Uh, and we're, we're conducting uh, some of some really um, enormous COVID vaccine safety uh, activities, which is which is pretty exciting. And uh, also, I guess I'm the, I'm the previous chair of of the WHO's Global Advisory Committee on Vaccine Safety. So this has been an area of interest uh, for me, both the effectiveness and safety of vaccines and, and how they work. Yep. And uh, we also have here with us uh, Brother Mama Thompson. He's always with us. So, <laughs> salam alaikum. <laughs> Wa alaikum salam, Prakadu. Let's, let's go straight to the point. So we'll focus a lot of issues within New Zealand. So um, the first question, uh, uh, Professor, um, can I uh, please ask, a uh, lot of my patients actually ask um, why we only have Pfizer vaccine here. And uh, I want choices. I want different vaccine. So, yeah. Okay. So the reason at the moment we've just got the Pfizer was right back at, at the end of last year uh, before we knew what vaccines were going to to, to work um, without much information, we put some agreements in or pre purchase agreements with four different companies. So there was Pfizer, uh, AstraZeneca, uh, Janssen or Johnson and Johnson, and Novavax. And at the time, uh, the, the one that was a little further ahead was the Pfizer vaccine. And when they had the big reveal um, at the end of last year, it, it looked, um, I guess, a little beyond expectation. Um, it, it, it looked very effective. So um, our, our regulatory agency, MedSafe, uh, reviewed the data and then authorised it for use because, of course, they have to authorise everything we use. And so um, as we brought that vaccine in, it became clear that it was a high performer and, and also that we were gathering um, you know, safety data on a lot of people. So because um, it can help with uh, deploying a vaccine, that you have just, just a single vaccine available rather than different ones because they di require different handling and you have to train all your vaccinators in how to use the different vaccines. Uh, it, it seemed like a good idea to use that as the backbone and then look to bring other vaccines in um, to complement that. So that's um, so that's how that's gone. And subsequently, our regulatory agencies approved the use of uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine and the Janssen vaccine. So um, we can expect to see um, delivery of the viral vector AstraZeneca vaccine uh, soon to um, to be used in some situations. Uh, but we probably won't see the Novavax vaccine for a while because the company's had production problems and uh, they haven't had authorization for wide use of that vaccine yet. So um, I'm not sure when we might see that one. Okay. So what about uh, overseas? Has it been uh, used overseas at the moment with the Novavax? No, um, it's not actually approved for use uh, anywhere yet, which is, I mean, that's a shame because the vaccine looks great, um, mm -hmm. but we at the moment only have data in a few thousand people um, until we it's deployed for use. But as I said, we, we still, we're still waiting for the approvals. Hmm. So just on, because one, you said it hasn't got the approval, but there's no stock. Is that because they haven't got approval so they haven't geared up or, or is it not? Part of, well, part of the approval process is actually looking at the production 
and all the facilities. Right. And I think um, to, to my understanding is that they have, because they've run into some challenges um, producing, um, there's been holdups with that authorization process. So while the vaccine looks amazing, um, yeah. that's been one of the problems. It's no okay. use being fantastic if you can't get it. <laughs> if it's the best, exactly. best thing yeah, you can't. It's a shame. And, and yeah. we look forward to it, but um, yeah. I'm not sure when. Yeah. Okay. And I think um, a few a few mentions that, you know, they prefer Novavax because it's slightly different from the mRNA vaccine. And as you would, you would have known, there were many concerns. Uh, people are concerned about uh, the mRNA vaccine. One of the comments we get on our Facebook uh, with regard to the program was, um, the mRNA vaccine will alter your DNA. So from your perspective, is that possible? Is it something that actually can happen? Okay, so so one of the reasons or some of the reasons that people like me really like the mRNA vaccine is because um, the way that it, that, that it works um, suggests that it's really likely to be really safe. And that's because the RNA... Um, cannot interact with your DNA. It can't get into the to the part of the cell where the DNA is is, is held and it can't it can't inter, it, it can't actually integrate or interact with it at all. So there's no capacity there. And the other thing is that this little RNA molecule is incredibly fragile. Mm. So um the, the it's actually protected by that little um that little sphere of, of, of little fats, fatty acids, little lipids to protect it. Um, and once it's injected um, and taken up by the cells, it is, um, only exists for a matter of hours to, to perhaps the top days. Uh, and then it, then it is no more. Okay. Okay. So what do you think? Um, so a lot of, so, you know, this is a very common uh, comment that I get, you know, um, I'm not uh, against vaccine, but I'm just not too sure about the mRNA vaccine. This is why I'm waiting for Novavax and whatever's going to come later, right? So uh, we may or may not approve Novavax. In, in, in New Zealand, in the current situation, what are your thoughts on that? Because the way how I say to my patient is, why waiting for something when we do know now that the Delta is in the community and um, we better be prepared now rather than actually three months later when the vaccine got approved and by then... It's probably everywhere and we might be infected with COVID. I mean, what, what are your take on that? Hmm. I think there's a very good chance that in that time you are likely to come in contact with the with the virus. And if you haven't been vaccinated, you haven't had your antiviral software installed, if you like. Um, so, um, so that's the concern. Uh, but I do think that there is this concept that the mRNA vaccines are, are newer than they actually are and they're not actually all that new. Um, hmm. They've been, um, we've been using e e mRNA vaccines in humans uh, for a couple of decades now. At first, they were uh, developed to uh, target cancer, so as a cancer, anti-cancer vaccine. Um, but then, uh, it, it, then the um, focus moved to uh, developing them for infectious diseases. So by the time COVID came along, we actually had, uh, I think, something like eight clinical trials um, in humans uh, for uh, infectious diseases, and and that included coronaviruses like like the MERS. Uh, so we had a bit of uh, quite a lot of experience, and and uh, also experience extending even further back than that, um, with a lot of work done in, in the lab and in animals before that. So there was a reasonable understanding um, before this happened. So it was kind of ready to go. Science was ready um, with this. So does that okay. mean then that um, science was ready, was there? So have we not done a good cell cell job on it? Is that part part of the like <laughs> like, like part of the problem? Like uh, we need super sales people to get out there and help promote it. Yeah, I think you need the people who sell Nike and, yes. and Coca Cola <laughs> yes. uh, on the job because I, I I I think you're right. I don't think we have done a very good job at selling stuff. Public health people in general, I think, aren't that good at selling their product, which is uh, an absence of disease. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we're not very creative about it. Um, so I think that's a very good point. We could have done a lot better in helping people understand the the uh, product. Well, it's never too late, I suppose. That's probably part of what we're trying to do now and things like <laughs> oh. that. So. You know, a lot of people are sort of saying, you know, they're um, 
you know, they don't know what's in it and things like that, and they want to know every little uh, point about that. And you meant, uh, mentioned uh, Coca-Cola and that before. You know, like there's a lot of stuff in Coca-Cola and other, you know, foods and things like that, which, you know, I definitely wouldn't eat and I don't eat um, um, those sort of stuff because, you know, I think they, they're worse, can be worse than a lot of things. You know, some of the things that got so much fat in it, so much, you know, say um, one that's got uh, 11 secret herbs and spices or something, you know, without mentioning names or, you know, what are they? What's in them? Um, and that sort of thing. So is there some things specifically inside the, you know, the, the these vaccines that are, you know, people have a reason to be concerned about worrying? I don't think so. I mean, the the, the ingredients in the vaccine are, are, are included on, on its data sheet and on lots of websites and things. And uh, and there's nothing in there that, that would, you know, I think that would give rise to concern. And everything that goes into something like this has to be rigorously assessed before, you know, well before it actually gets put into a product that goes into a human and, and then beyond. So, um one thing I notice, and this is with other vaccines as, as well, is that people can really worry about these uh, ingredients and um, or even what we what we call excipients, which means sometimes you've only got the tiniest, tiniest little amount and everything is poisonous, including water, for example, mm. yet nothing is poisonous. It always depends on how much you're given. That's the dose that makes the poison. Yeah. And I think people get afraid of... Uh, long chemical sounding names, for example, which uh, which actually everything has a long chemical sounding name. So um, what goes into these products is not considered to be um, dangerous uh, in, in any way. So I think, though, it's important to step back and also look at the product as a whole and how safe is it? Um, and I think that's what we, you know, I think we really need to talk about how safe is this product as a whole as we use it. Hmm. That's so right. that yeah, I was just going to say, isn't that your expertise on safety, vaccine yes. safety? So maybe you should comment on how safe it is. Let's 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 start with the uh, um, with the uh, because you know a lot of people are reading that they're reading and they're looking at, at some things, certain things, and I think the a lot of people also look at the MedSafe, right? And um, uh, I see this on the Facebook a lot going around. Um, I think the most recent is uh, report I think on the 29th of September, I believe. Oh, no, there's another one actually from uh, October. I think uh, no, no, this is the old one. Um, so there's about 30,000 adverse effects uh, at the moment in uh, reported to MedSafe. What are your takes on that? Um, uh, what are your takes on that? Let's start on that first. And then if you can just discuss that on the uh, safety of the vaccine and the process that we do in New Zealand about monitoring it, who reported mm -hmm. it and how do we actually count so we make sure that you know this this is actually correct because people are thinking that we're hiding the numbers you know um, there are people dying uh, on a daily basis from vaccine and but the doctors are hiding them so mm. if you get it, just explain to me the process and i'll try to bring up the the most recent report on medsafe so we can uh, go through that inshallah okay so 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 let's go there um vaccine safety so first of all uh what um, MedSafe do, what what what, um, and other similar approaches um, overseas, and actually most countries actually have a system like this, um, and that's just one component of how we we look at vaccine safety. So what you want to see is people uh, reporting things. So you want a, a clinicians and nurses and also people, the the patients, if if if, if something's occurred after receiving the vaccine, you, you want to see that reported. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, that the vaccine has caused this event. But what you want to see is if you get lots of reports, um, then the people down there that receive the reports, that are reading them, that are looking at them, actually can pick up signals or things that are unexpected. Um, so... Um, what they will also do is um, when you've got serious events that are, uh, that they're seeing is to apply a whole lot of criteria in, in assessing that. So they want to know um, what is this you know, condition that this person's presented with 
Um, so they're going to need lots of information. And also, what are the chances that it's um, related to having received the vaccine? So, so that's something that happens down there. And when those reports go up, um, it's really important to know that um, they're not necessarily caused by the vaccine. So they're not actually necessary adverse effects. They're actually adverse events. So events could be caused by anything. But really important process. And that's only the beginning. So what happens... What happens then is what you need to look at is, are you seeing more than you would otherwise normally expect? So you have to look what we what we call observed over expected. So we've got what we normally see, you know, trotting along over time. And are we seeing suddenly more of these things? So that's the, that's another step. And, and what you can do then is, is can you verify that there is a concern here? Um, so if you see more than you expect, you go, oh, we've got a safety signal. If you are concerned about something, then what you need to do is go and have a look and start doing a whole lot of approaches that compare the risk of something in vaccinated people with the risk in unvaccinated people. Um, so that's a whole, like a whole lot of activities that have to happen. And that's how we build up the knowledge about the safety of a product. And what we, I'm seeing and you're seeing um, and, and it's being circulated where um, are all these what we call spontaneous or events that may or may not be related to the vaccine without talking about all the massive data uh, that that actually says okay these things you're no more at risk of having these things happen um, after vaccination than you were without vaccination and now we know that there are some things you know um, that are, are associated with a higher risk when you receive the vaccine um, but that's not um, that's not necessarily captured well by these sort of systems. Does that help answer some of that? Yes. The whole process. Yes. So I'll just print up the some of the numbers here because this is what's going around on the on the Facebook on the YouTube. You know, uh, thirty thousand serious side effects. So I'm just going to bring up the the MedSafe itself. Um, so if you look here, it says here a total of about twenty nine thousand, and um, uh, if our adverse events report that were non-serious, uh, but it's about 1,050 reports that were serious. And, and what you mentioned before uh, about the, with regards to um, the side effects, it may or may not be related to it. And the majority of the time, the most of the adverse events are actually uh, very mild cases, headache, dizziness, uh, pain, uh, feeling a bit tired, feeling a bit nauseous. And again, this is quite subjective you know uh, and, and if you are a little bit nervous about having vaccine and after you get a vaccine you can you could feel the same as well in fact i actually felt like that the first time i had the vaccine <laughs> i was a bit concerned about it and i think i had my first dose and i was like oh you know what if i'm feeling is am i dizzy am i so you you could feel like that as well and then that you know then you can end up seeing a doctor a gp and a doctor will actually put that as a, a adverse events and report it to medsafe so the main thing, one of the things that's been going around is about death, right? And um, so people die from having vaccine. And can you, do you, are you able to just explain about, you know, so we know that people die after having vaccine. It may or may not be related to vaccine. But what do you actually need to look at is also the, the so-called natural death rate. If you can explain to us what that means, uh, what does it mean? So you, you're always going to get people who die with or without the vaccine. So how do you calculate that and what do you, uh, what do you refer by, uh, what did Messi refer by that? Mm. So um, when it comes to deaths, of course, every, every, every single death reported must be um, assessed. Um, and for, for many of those, there'll be an obvious, you know, a cause. Um, and you can see there um, by how they've listed it that they didn't have enough information on 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 these some of these deaths, and uh, so you can't make any assessment. Now, now any death, of course, that's thought possibly related will have to be investigated absolutely thoroughly. Um, now, of course, every year in New Zealand, I think um, I'm. Not sure of the numbers, but there's you know many of something in the order of I don't know thirty or forty thousand people die every year, and you break that down into how many people die every week. For example, it's a lot. It's a lot of people, and they're not all older people. Some of the unfortunately, um, you know, deaths also do occur in younger people as well, and including sudden unexpected death. 
So um, when you put all of that together and you go out and you're vaccinating just about your entire uh, population, virtually all the deaths that occur um, naturally are going to occur after vaccination. And some of those are going to occur in the week or the two weeks or the month or, or and so forth. So that's something we have to manage. And part of the vaccine science is to kind of tease out and determine um, if there's actually any increased risk associated with the vaccine. And, and as I think it's been well um, uh, documented in the media, et cetera, that there is a death that is thought possibly related to the vaccine. Um, and when you put that together with the other similar reports overseas and other, you know, undergoing other investigations, this risk um, looks uh, like it, if it exists at all is in the order of perhaps one and it's big numbers, 10 million, maybe tens of millions or 100 million or something. It's extremely rare. Mm -hmm. um, so. Are we seeing any more deaths than we would normally expect after vaccinating most of our population? No, we're not. Okay. Some could also say that um, because of lockdown, there's a lot less people had died because they weren't doing risky things, they weren't driving so much and things like that. So does that mean that, you know, lockdown is good? Because we're, we're not killing ourselves. Well, yeah, like, is, that's a dangerous topic. One of those. I know, but you know. <laughs> Although we could, some of us could be eating ourselves to death. In well, our that's, that's, house. well, that's that's a problem as well. It's, yeah. mm, absolutely agree, and that's why um, that's why you need a lot of other approaches. Um, yeah. Observed over looking at the observed over expectors is is not sufficient. You need to, to then invoke Break all of those yeah. other rigorous pro approaches as well. Yeah. I'm not sure, um, you know, a lot of also people worried about myocarditis and, and pericarditis. And, you know, it's on the medicine, it's very clear. you got myopericarditis, pericarditis, myocarditis, but uh, I think I've got just over 130, 40 cases here. Um, so uh, do you know if there's uh, big numbers of them actually uh, end up with death? I think there's only one case, is that correct, that uh, possibly die or is it not correct? Oh. There, there, that that case, yeah, that, there's that case. Um, that that's a possibility. But but in fact, you you there are um, the the vaccine is associated with an increased risk of uh, myocarditis and pericarditis. That's been I think reasonably well established now. Um, the risk is is still very small, but uh, but it seems to be weighted or the the the. The people in our community that are more at risk of this happening, particularly the myocarditis, are actually uh, a younger age group, um, mainly males, uh, after their second dose. Um, right. So that's been established um, with some really good data from overseas, you know, in bigger populations. Because when you've got rare stuff like this, it's oh. quite hard when we've just got this itty bitty little New Zealand population. population. So, so that's um, that's something that people need to be aware of that, about this risk. But something we can say about the cases that uh, are likely caused by the vaccine is that they tend to be quite mild um, and self limiting and uh, are, are, are treated um, fairly conservatively with things like anti-inflammatories. And um, so far, what we're seeing is that resolution, you know, seems, you know, it seems to occur um, after a relatively short period. Um, now, when you're thinking about this, you have to think about what the risk is if you actually got the infection itself. And that yeah. the infection itself is actually more like, you're more likely to have it um, if you got right. infected. And it's also more likely to be um, more severe and more dangerous. So um, I think um, that's what, you know, some of the rigorous kind of safety approaches have picked up and been able to kind of identify. So we've got a bit of a handle, a little bit more of a handle on that one now. Okay. So um, you're saying there's, uh, do you know the numbers uh, in terms of the risk if you are infected with uh, the actual virus um, that you will develop pericarditis or myocarditis compared to those of being vaccinated? So pulling together some um, data from different different places, and I'm thinking primarily of the uh, data from the US who have some pretty, pretty good uh, vaccine safety um, monitoring systems, and uh, also from Israel. 
Um, now in the US, I've just the most recent data presented. Um, so let's just focus on those that are high at risk, because if it's someone like me, it's probably the risk is about one in a million. Um, but if it's it's a younger, like a, a, a younger male, uh, particularly under 30, and even more so in the adolescence, the highest risk second dose is in the order of, and I saw today, it was about 50 to 70 um, mm -hmm. per million. And I think in Israel, it's been reported as a little bit higher than that. The Israeli data show that in this group, the risk for disease is, I think, maybe seven times higher, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So those are the sort of numbers we're talking about. But of course, a lot more likely to be severe oh, no. if no. you've got an infection. <clears throat> And there's a few comments coming through. Inshallah, we'll, re we'll respond to that after this. Um, but uh, just my next question is, uh, Professor, is with regards to blood clots. I mean, this is something that's um, um, uh, quite common, as in being discussed on a regular basis. Um, mm -hmm. I've read some studies about, you know, if you're actually infected with COVID, you're yeah, uh, more likely to have the blood clots compared to it if you have been vaccinated. So if you could just explain on that uh, as well um, for the viewers, inshallah. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so absolutely, the the um, the disease itself is actually associated with a huge risk of of blood clots. Um, the blood clots. Um, there's some, an unusual type of blood clot that's been um, a, a, associated with um, the viral vector vaccines. So not the mRNA, but the viral vector vaccines. So that that came up um, at first with the AstraZeneca vaccine, and again, the the effects are, are some members of our population are more at risk and that in this case is um is women or, or females uh, under the age of 40 are at higher risk of, of this event occurring so again that's another consideration um for that group okay now um there's one comment here mentioned about um how women got affected after taking vaccine um you know they're not having a regular period um or not having regular menses is it something, you know, and of course there were concerns about that, you know, if young children, they may not be able to get pregnant. Is this something remotely possible uh, can be caused by the vaccine? So, should we, uh, at first, the, the irregular periods and bleeding and things like that, of course, that's a very common thing um that happens um naturally anyway um yeah. and um i've actually had a colleague recently has been um has been looking closely at you know any emerging data on that one and that one doesn't seem to really be standing up um it's likely that what we're seeing is is the normal you know but also i think we shouldn't underestimate the uh, impact of the enormous amount of stress and anxiety that people are undergoing at the moment as well yeah. um which we know can can um, bring on all sorts of symptoms. So I think we should acknowledge acknowledge that. So at the moment, there doesn't seem to be any difference between people who've had a vaccine and people who haven't. In terms of the infertility um, issues, uh, of course, pregnant pregnant women are at higher risk of complications from this disease, um, significantly so. And also, um, there's a, a risk of um, uh, serious adverse outcomes to the pregnancy. Uh, so they've been um prioritized for receiving the vaccine now um there's some reasonable data now available on the safety in pregnancy showing that um that there's there's no increased risk associated with the vaccine for any of the outcomes that you might be concerned about in terms of fertility again there's absolutely no evidence of that and also i think we need to go back to um how biologically that could actually happen mm. and the the vaccine is um and it's i think this is where it's helpful to understand what happens to the vaccine when you um when you inject it and so um it's taken up at the injection site and and a lot of people when they get a sore arm you know that's actually that inflammatory process occurring there as as um immune cells come come to the site and take up that vaccine and um once the rna has um done its job it ceases to exist so so inside that cell it's it's all over uh, is no more and then the spike protein that's produced um after that is then in that cell uh most of that's just broken into little fragments inside the cell and then displayed on the surface the cell goes 
to your local lymph node or those those um, lymph nodes under the, the under your arm. And some people get some um, swelling and pain under their arm, which is where um, the immune response is being produced. And then once that, then, then that's no more either. The spike protein is no more. So there's really no process by which this vaccine can actually access um, you know, uh, any of your, if any of those parts of the of the body, it really does generally stay restricted to that um, site. So that's another sort of a biological reason why we're not seeing any um, indication that this is this is a problem. Okay, <clears throat> I did actually see um, some. I can't remember where it was. A little video of someone, um, I think in Australia or something, who didn't get vaccinated um because he wanted to wait and wait and he got the COVID and he suffered badly from the COVID and he said that he wished he had got it done because he's now he's got ongoing uh, problems from the um side effects of the COVID uh, um vaccine you know after several months of supposedly recovered he's still got side effects from from what happened there so you know the, the people may be against the vaccine you know for the reasons but you know the the actual virus itself is a lot more dangerous, I think, than you know what the vaccine could ever be. I think it's easy to lose sight of what we're actually vaccinating against. Sometimes with so much focus going on the vaccine that people forget actually there's What's a reason the exactly <laughs> um, why why we've gone to all this effort to try and get this vaccine out there. And I mm. think also obsessing over over dead people over death. Um, and even hospitalizations forgets about this thing that you just mentioned, long COVID. And yeah. long COVID is actually affecting uh, a, 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 about half of the people that get COVID actually have some degree of these ongoing uh, symptoms that can get can affect pretty much all organs of the body. Um, one of the ones that's a bit scary is the brain fog that yes. people describe and there's some um there's some data that's come from the uk where they've used biobanks um mm. of brain scans and um and then looked after uh, after um, you still got before and after and the changes to the brain architecture that's been associated with this disease which sort of explain helps explain that fogginess that people describe and some people are still not re recovering you know while well, some recover after a few weeks others after maybe three months there's still people that have these ongoing problems and what's that going to mean long term going forward um for these people which um of course are a significant number of people mm. it's a long COVID. i think i read about something you drop your iq by 10 or 20 points or something like that <laughs> well, i better not, I bet not get it i won't have anything left <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah. um, the uh, one of the things that um, uh, there's a video at the moment going around as well about uh, someone that has uh, sort of like a Tourette syndrome uh, after being uh, infected with uh, after being injected with a vaccine and brain fog, and I think all those videos um, create fears. You know, a lot of people are worried and concerned about what will happen to me, what will happen to my children if I'm the only one that actually work. And we, you know, we already in lockdown. We, we, some, some of us lost job. And if we actually have vaccine and we got um, brain fog, we don't want that. And 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 that's a and it's a real concern. And I think a lot of my patients are, are, are like that. And the way what the way how I explain is, um, uh, you know, the COVID is here. The Delta is here. Delta virus is here. And the question is, it's just the matter of time when whether we'll be exposed to it or not. Um, so we better be prepared at least with the vaccine that we know have less risk compared to actually get the real D. That's, that's what I, I normally explain um, to my patients. Um, one of the points, uh, uh, Professor, um, people, you know, you mentioned about we focus on the hospitalization, death, and, um, you know, the vaccine. One of the thing is uh, people are scared because they said, you know, the, the, the vaccine was developed too quick. And um, and uh, this is again quite common, and uh, people always talk about this being experimental because it hasn't been approved, and it's been caught over and over again on the Facebook, it's been shared, been sent on the on the WhatsApp, on the Telegram. You know, you see this vaccine hasn't been approved. Look, they're still in trial. So why are we injecting ourselves uh, with this trial vaccine 
how sure are we that it is safe for us long term? So if you are able to explain the process before we that we get this far, you know, that it, in a, has it gone through at least some sort of trial? Has it at least got some sort of uh, a good safety uh, indications or, or concerns? Yeah, if you can just explain on that. Please. Sure. Okay. So um, I think we, we touched on before about science being ready to, mm -hmm. to produce a vaccine, which was then ready to go into humans. Um, and the process of, of the clinic, what we call the clinical development program for a vaccine can take, as people keep pointing out, can take many years. Mm -hmm. But there are reasons why it takes so long. Um, and, and so the reasons are, um, first of all, it's enormously expensive. So to bring a vaccine in modern times now, to bring a vaccine to a point where you you deploy it, you you authorize it and deploy it, is in the order of two point eight billion dollars. So if you're um and and that's often been left to the pharmaceutical companies who you know um, big money, um but also big risk and you know they're not inclined to want to um take too much risk in a product that they're not going to be able to make money. <laughs> That's the That's reality right. of it, um, yes. and it's not something that governments tend to tend to, to to do. So that was a problem. Now we removed that problem. Um, there was money coming to for all of us, so that problem was removed. The next problem is that um, if you want to test if a vaccine works or not, you need to have people getting the the, the disease, and that can take a really long time because because you need lots of disease around. Of course, that was not a problem. Um, lots of COVID. And the next problem is to recruit people into your study. That can take years. Um, this time, they're banging down the door. So recruitment happened very quickly. Um, and then the next thing is that um, usually, and going back to this often being left to the pharmaceutical companies, you do the small study first and then you sit, you know, look at the look at the results and everyone no doubt sits around a board table and think about the investment for the next stage. That must take ages. And then the same thing happens for the next slightly bigger studies. And then going to the phase, what you call the phase three, which is tens of thousands of people, costs a fortune, Big decision. So all of that um, was um, removed and overlapped. As soon as you were ready to go to the next stage, you did it like that, really. But you had the same number of people. You had the same rigor. And you had agreed that um, once you had accumulated enough cases in your participants, you were going to be able to have a look at the data. And, uh, and that's what happened. Um, so the regulatory agencies, instead of waiting till the end of all of this and then facing mountains and thousands and thousands of pages of data, they actually went along at the same time and reviewed the data like a rolling review as it came to hand as well. Those are the things that meant it could go through the clinical program um, really fast. These are the things that have hampered us from getting vaccines out to, um, to populations who've needed them. Um, for decades and and so this sort of really shows what we can achieve if we all work together rather than um you know our old model which was really a little bit broken in my opinion so i think i think that part doesn't doesn't bother me and the idea that it's experimental i think is flawed i think that's a word that's being used out of place here um, I would say this is a vaccine that's no longer investigational and in that it's no longer experimental in, in that sense. It's been approved for use. It's been fully approved for use. Um, originally, it was authorised in the US under emergency use. New Zealand doesn't have an emergency use pathway. We'd actually approved it fully for a period of time where you want to see more and more data coming in uh, and so forth. So that's 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 been ongoing. So... We study vaccines as a vaccinologist. Vac studying vaccines is what we do. So we, there's experiments going on vaccines that are like smallpox vaccines still studied in experiments that's over 200 years old. So we don't stop and we should never stop. So in a sense, they're, they're always also experimental in that sense. It's not, I mean, having um, I think probably a billion or so doses um, administered now across the planet. I think it's it's very unreasonable to be calling it experimental. Oh, oh. So, so could, could, I, could I just 
that's going to say something. So the unusual thing about this one was because normally the the uh, pharmaceutical companies are all doing everything hush hush behind closed doors. Everything's all secret, secret, um, and that's why it takes so long because they're going through it and they try to get the funding to do it and things like that. But here, you like you said, the model just went totally reversed or something where it was all open pretty much apart from they I don't know if they were saying what's going into it you know exactly the ingredients of this or that but I'm sure there's been enough study to know what's going into the different ones and I think there was um, um, not you know with some of these other companies were working together to so because that rush was you know when it first came out to try and get something out and they said oh it's going to be a year and this and that and then it came quicker now because you said there is a, a you know so many willing people to come there, like millions of people, you could start sort of um, studying on, and then you can see what the disease is doing. You can do some tests and see, oh, look, it's working quite well. Where some, like you said, if you only got a small group that you're studying, it can take ages and ages and oh. years and years. Um, mm. And you know the cooperation, I think worldwide, I think was probably what helped to get it done a lot quicker. Collaboration was uh, remarkable. So, the, so for the the Pfizer one, of, of, of that was uh, um, really the the. Um, although Pfizer have been working on mRNA, um, it was actually this 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 brainchild here has come from a small biotech company, yeah. um, and and the, that that's a collaboration. But it was also very bizarre to see um, multi big multinationals coming together and collaborating. Um, and some of them, they'd start their own program, they'd go down the road of their own development program, go abandon it because it doesn't look like that's going to be the one, and then hook up with these other guys over here that have got, got a winner, but they need more production. And over here, you've got a, a company that actually knows how to do this. So um, so there was that. But what I come back to, like previously, um, while, of course, all of the um, stuff about... Uh, I guess, investment and financials, and that would be, I'm sure, and, and a lot of proprietary information. Um, if a company was going to run a clinical trial, um, it would always have to be quite, um, it would be, always be the, the protocol and everything would need to be um, out there, but also ethically approved and, and all of those processes would always have to be in place. Um, so there is, is always required a certain degree of transparency, but, but for most people, normally that's quite boring <laughs> and it only becomes interesting when someone's got something on the table that looks viable and then we, we start, you know, getting a bit more interested. Oh, you've got a program over there. Well, well you know, come back to me in five years when you've got something. <laughs> Yeah. I've, I've got a few more questions here, uh, uh, Professor. What, what are your thoughts on ivermectin? You see, I've, I've, I've been a few patients uh, ask me, um, can you prescribe ivermectin for me to, to take? Um, and that's because of the study that shows, you know, uh, in the lab that ivermectin somehow um, uh, works well to kill the virus. Um, but my understanding as well, the dosage that is required is actually quite high to reach that level on the body as well. So, have you got any thoughts about it? Have you read any studies about it at all with regards to ivermectin uh, to prevent uh, uh, and to stop that from getting sick? Yeah. Mm. So, um, I mean, I think ivermectin is, is an example of a number of, of products that uh, if we, we sort of turn the clock back when, when COVID still uh, first uh, emerged and you can imagine all of these um you know, health professionals faced with these people that were very sick and and dying, and uh, and without um, yet a, a good pathway for treatment. So there was a, a desire to pretty much throw everything, including the kitchen sink, you know, to see what what would work, what would um, what would be able to help these patients. So there was a whole lot of data that emerged early on uh, for all sorts of things, and. Um, and then it sort of settled down into more rigorous um, studies as, um, uh, and, and some of these things fell by the way. They didn't, you know, more rigorous studies showed that they weren't particularly helpful. And of course, there could potentially be harms. Um, whereas others have actually um, come through and shown to be more useful. So um, ivermectin is, is, a, is one that's, that's not really held up in terms of being um, particularly useful. Um, and there are things that are, are better and uh, also that there could be harms from it. So, so it's not like there's anything being kind of covered up or anything, but just um, it's not perhaps the best uh, tool in our armory. And as um, treatments have evolved, 
um, there's, you know, the survival rates, for example, are going up. And there's a pretty exciting new one, I think, that's been in the news a bit, um, a pill that can that is um, antiviral that's um, probably can, trumping everything else. <laughs> I can never pronounce, is it molnupiravir or something yes. like that? I, I, yeah, something along that <laughs> it's line. <laughs> hard to roll off, but, um, <laughs> but that, there's a, it's an example of something that looks like it might be really useful. Why don't, they just make it, why don't they just make it simple, simple COVID killer or something, you know, it's like everyone, can, <laughs> everyone can say it. That's technically correct too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So do, in, in New Zealand, these medications, that uh, the antiviral that, um, uh, that the government has agreed to buy, will this be here soon? Do you happen to know if there's going to be um, in New Zealand anytime soon or is it gonna, still going to be a while away? Uh, I've got no inside information, but I do. I do hope that we'll be able to see it soon. It is, of course, very, very new. Oh, yes, <laughs> but it has yes. A, I don't think it's been approved yet. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. So I um, just watch the space. It's interesting, actually, because a lot of people are saying, you know, we want options, and some of them, like Novavax, is still new as such, but Pfizer has been uh, used uh, extensively. You know, um, so I'm more comfortable with what being used <laughs> extensively rather than. Um, the one that just hasn't been approved, and that's my perspective anyway. Yeah, um, well, you say what's tried and true. You know, you sort of want to stick to that. You know, the, what mm. what works. You know, uh, the best is probably the best we should use. And um, you know, I don't know whether it was uh, you know good management by the the government to choose this one, or whether it was just um, you know that's what they put the order in first, and it just happened to be that, or you know, or the studies. Um, um, you know, Professor, you might know better if, you know, why it was chosen, this one, um, out of, you know, they just put a, you know, pin something all on the board and just blindfold it and just pick which one or is it... I'd like to think they had good advice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so they were taking, you know, there was a there was an advisory committee that was um, reviewing and looking at the data uh, as it came through, that, and that's a, a group that, that I was on at the time. And, um, and as you see the data coming through, you know, I think it really helps inform. Uh, there were definitely wasn't any uh, blindfolds yes. and data or anything like that going on. Um, and, and as we saw um, these mRNA a vaccines emerge, it became clearer and clearer that they were going to, they were looking like they might be a really good bet. Um, so having having one of those in the in the, in the um, you know in the mix, and also the other front runners were the um, viral vector that the AstraZeneca was one of the front, you know, it was reasonably far advanced. And the um, we knew Novavax also got hit the ground running, but of course they've unfortunately been a bit stalled. But um, yes. but it seemed like you need to sort of don't put all your eggs in one basket. And mm. uh, and this one, I think I think we've been um, it's incredible to have the two most effective vaccines, the the basically first two of the first to roll off. Um, mm. They they've set a very high bar. I think no vaccine's perfect. No vaccine's a hundred percent effective and a hundred percent safe, um, and we have to realise that there's no magic bullets here. But they have set a, a very high bar indeed. I think. Yeah. I'll have two more points actually, and then we're and then uh, uh, Thompson, if you got anything else, yeah. uh, one is you know uh, uh, a lot of comments about the booster dose. So are we going to be? Are you expecting us to having a booster dose every six months? And, um, you know, um, this is why people say they're making money, you know, because just having <laughs> booster after booster um, for how long, we don't know. So what are your insight or your your advice or your answer to that when someone said <laughs> that to you? <laughs> so so my take on it, and, and this is um, looking like uh, some of the, the vaccines we use in our, you know, normal vaccine schedule, is that um, you give a couple of doses at, to prime to get the immune system primed. So that's what we're doing now, two doses. And then you come along down the track after that immune response has been allowed to mature, which takes some months. And when you come along with the booster, you actually boost um, 
you know, that immunity you've been developing. And you end up with a much higher level of immunity than when you maxed out after the after the second dose. So um, the booster, re- and then that's likely to be um, a lot more sustained. So um, it, 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 I think um, coming along, uh, boosting all the time, I think is highly unlikely, unless you end up getting a, a really unfortunate variant, which means really you're coming along with a different formulation. So let's oh, hope yeah. that we're not facing that anytime soon. Oh. Um, but I think what's important when you see the waning, you see some waning immunity, what you're seeing is the antibodies that uh, in the blood that have been generated uh, hang around for only so long and they, then they start then they start to wane. There's no sense uh, the body putting effort into maintaining high levels of those if you don't need them. Mm. What the body still has is the memory. And so you see people becoming, you know, the, the, the risk of becoming infected with the virus goes up mm. over time. But you're still seeing some pretty good um, um, sustained protection against that, you know, serious disease, hospitalizations, things like that. Um, And that's when the memory kicks in. So a person who um, has been vaccinated and then gets infection uh, has has the infection for a shorter time overall than an unvaccinated person. Um, And then their memory kicks in and uh, and protects them generally against... um, against severe disease. So so what we're doing is giving another a jolt to expand those antibodies again. And that might be a good strategy to help us as we go forward um, with that, maintain, reducing that ongoing transmission as well. Um, so I think we can expect boosters for um, sort of the bulk of the rest of us, not, not the high risk people, they'll probably get it sooner, but for the rest of us a bit later. And I think that that will probably complete our um you know our vaccine schedule that we get mm-hmm. yeah so wh- one of the thing uh, so just to add on to that is there was a study uh, i think a few months ago mentioned about um that if you are naturally infected with uh, covid you have higher antibodies compared to you've been vaccinated so uh so one of the question i've got was well, we might as well just ex- expose ourselves because this is the best way to protect long term rather than having a booster every six months. And uh, this is one of the points. Uh, I think that, you know, what are your take on that study? I'm, I'm sure you're well aware of that study. Yeah. So what, what the, the problem with natural immunity is that it's highly variable. So some people develop some quite reasonable immunity and others, it's very poor. And if, and and um and it also wanes over time. So it's not a, a one hit wonder either. And of course, you're risking all of those things that, you know, come with the disease. So um, it's probably not the ideal way um, to, to get your protection. And the best protection actually comes from um, when somebody's had the infection and then they get a booster, like it's effectively a booster dose of vaccine. You give them a dose of vaccine and they have the best protection overall. Um, but actually the protection that you get from the vaccine is more consistent, more reliable, and is also holding up um, really well. So um, overall, there's, there's a bit of uh, significant risk um, going for the natural way <laughs> and uh, not necessarily going to put you in that much of a, 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 give you that much more advantage to somebody who's, who's been vaccinated. So mm. with, with with that then, is in the past, I'm not sure if it still is, in terms of vaccinations way back, did they used to give a small dose of an actual disease to try and build that immunity? And is that what could be used in this case as well? Is, is, that, or is that just, you know, old wives' tales? Well, no, we do that. That's right. That was the the basis of um, of of vaccines was either to give a weakened form, so um, a weakened form that wasn't going to be too dangerous, um, or to give a fragment um, of of the whatever it was, the bacteria or the virus or something, just mm-hmm. to give a little fragment of it. And um, and that was really the basis of this whole um, science for a long time. Of course, that's evolved a lot, and we've got much better at, at how we design these things. Um, but if I'm also um, reading you right, once we um, so say we, we you know be, become well vaccinated, uh, we're allowed out. <laughs> um, 
to play. Yes. <laughs> of course, COVID will be around. COVID will yeah. will circulate and it will be infecting people. And and as that happens, um, vaccinated people will all become exposed. Now, I think that's likely to act as a natural boosting of the population. Yeah as it circulates and going forward long term that might be um you know to an advantage providing we can um you know be in a situation where we're protecting ourselves from from getting um really sick in the first place and having too many people get sick and overwhelm our our health systems yeah Mm. yeah another another thing i wanted to ask was like with the coronavirus vaccine does it help on anything else like is it something that can or, or are these things just so targeted to one thing that that's all they'll help? Like, will it cure my balding and things like this or, you know, <laughs> this sort of stuff or, you know, <laughs> something well, else? I was hoping the superpowers might oh. help, but alas. <laughs> <laughs> no, they are they are highly targeted, um, which is right. a good thing probably, yes. um, but also um, it's not going to be a one a one hit wonder. It's not going yeah. to protect you from the flu or anything like that. All right. Well, that's another question I was going to ask because you hear you talk about superpowers and things like that. You hear these some of these stories going around that you know where you've had the thing put in your arm is um, it's magnetic now, and I was hoping it's going to be a, a new holder for my phone. You know, I can just sort of won't have to put it in my pocket, and every time I want to answer, it, I can just pick it up. You know, is that? Um, well, the... yeah. Well, well, well. I, I I've also suffered from that, but I've been um, I've been drawn to the refrigerator. Um, oh, right. so that's unfortunate. <laughs> So the door keeps opening as you walk past it, is it, with your arm? Indeed. <laughs> yes. I haven't had that one. Maybe mine's not strong enough, magnetic. <laughs> I need to get a booster. To... No, so we um, are joking. We are joking here for anyone watching. Yes, yes. Now, uh, with regards to um, the uh, vaccine mandate, right, uh, uh, Professor, with, with, and obviously, uh, you know, the government is trying to do something and um, – What's the idea of, you know, getting only vaccinated people at the moment, be at school, for example? And, and I think I think I'm sure Auckland University only allow if you're fully vaccinated to be at the university now. Um, so you know all those places. So what was the reason for? What's the science behind it? Why do we do this to start with? And um, and maybe later when things are a bit more subsided and getting better, what 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 are we trying to achieve here? You know, mm. to start with, yeah. It is an extraordinary move. Um, and I think we we um, have seen uh, in the past, but only very rarely, um, these types of uh, mandates being being invoked. And and that's really as a result of this is actually an exceptional public health issue. This is not normal, um, and we don't. Um, but one of the things is a lot of the mandates are not coming from the government; they're actually coming from from the companies themselves. Mm. Um, who are the ones that are setting um, setting what they want, and that that's I mean I don't quite understand all the all the health and safety and employment law, but it is a health and safety thing um, about keeping their workplace and their employees safe. safe. Yeah. So I appreciate this is quite unprecedented for us um, in New Zealand, and it's not it's not a place we're going you know in the future really. It's about it's about what we do now with this. Um, extraordinarily extraordinary and and I, I mean fair to say catastrophic kind of situation uh, we find ourselves in now yeah well it, it's you know I have a business and I do a lot of work in uh, like the construction area and stuff like that and also schools and universities and place like that and like um, I actually had an appointment today um, at a school and you know they said well you need to be vaccinated fine I send my double vaccination uh, certificate through and said you need to have a um, a um, test as well and I had one which was 14 days old and they cancelled the appointment and I was double vaccinated and had that which my understanding of even from the government's MOE Ministry of Education thing it says those who are double vaccinated um, have can prove that and then you only have to have a, a test done those who are single vaccinated have to have a weekly test done. So there's a lot of confusion out there mm-hmm. over, um, you know, what is needed and, and things right. like that. And I think this is going to cause some even a bit more right. stress and that, um, you know, because we, we're getting yeah. every day, you know, saying, um, please, if you're not double vaccinated, don't turn up on the job anymore. 
um, mm. you know, this and this and this. So, um, you know, so it, 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 it seems, yeah, quite intimidating, isn't it? It, as it well, is so, um, for employees, and and I think there's some some. I, I get a sense that 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 there's a sense of um, perhaps some sort of um, a panic or, or or something going on as well, which of course contributes to people's anxiety about the whole thing as well, and. It, what people see as inconsistencies and things that don't make sense that don't seem uh, logical as yeah. well. So um, yeah, I, I appreciate that. I'm sort of we're seeing this going on all over the place. I hope that we can work our way work through, through it, it. Yeah. because it's, yeah. it's 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 really hard. It's really it is tough times right now. I think we must acknowledge that and also what people are going through um, in terms of their you know anxiety and and stress. Mm, yeah. Mm, mm. Well, hopefully we are coming to an end, you know, because uh, I think I was looking at Japan and uh, their cases are going down. Um, sort of the virus has stopped mutating itself, they said in, in Japan. Um, I haven't looked into it. I know from my brother because he lives there. Um, and uh, so that's interesting. Um, uh, anyhow, I think I just got one more question from my side. I think I think we we're coming to an end now. I think it's over an hour actually. <laughs> we, yes. we can talk go on and on, <laughs> but I think we all have to have dinner. <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing that I was thinking about before is with regards to the um. Uh, oh, I think I mean, I missed my notes now. Uh, with regards to the vaccine, is um. We do know that there's a case today that someone passed or passed away and during the home isolation, and this guy happened to be double vex. Obviously, we haven't, we haven't, we don't know the whole case. We don't know anything much about it. We only know what the media have said to us. So, what are your? Um, are you able to put in a simple numbers for for our viewers? Um, for example, if you are not vaccinated, what are the risk of you of um, getting infected, and what are the risk of you? actually you know being unwell with it do you do you happen to know the numbers and if you are double vex what are the chance of you to actually develop complications out of it you know or die from the from the uh, virus itself well i do know that with our um our delta outbreak here now in mm -hmm. new zealand i think about one point uh 1.3 or one um more between one and two out of um every hundred people who who were um hospitalized so let's say that's pretty serious <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, were double vaxxed the rest were not mm -hmm. so so um you know it's hard to put put numbers on these things especially when you've got things to consider like um if, if this is affecting older people like if it was in an aged care facility for example it might you know you're more likely to see the vaccine fail but by and large, uh, overwhelmingly, uh, only a little shy of, of everybody going to hospital is unvaccinated or only partially vaccinated. Most of them are unvaccinated. Oh, oh. Mm -hmm. All right. So that, that's a good reason for all of us to get vaccinated. I'm double exactly. jab. I'm, yes. I'm, you know, you are too. And a prison professor, you must be double jab. <laughs> yes, <laughs> <you're bad>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All yeah. right. Anything else, Mohammed Thompson? Um, no, no, I haven't got you. Took some of my questions already. So oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so that's, so that's sort of left me not to say too much. But um, no, it's good. Um, you know, it's very good. Uh, uh, hopefully, people got something from it, and you know, we try to bring the the you know the message of you know from the experts, so we get the experts on who know what they're talking about. So thank you, um, Dr. Helen or Professor Helen, for coming on, and uh, we really appreciate it. And um, you know, this is probably, I think, the third one we've done on this on this yes. vex, yes. and it's um, mm. and it's you know may not be the last. It, you know, it sort of goes on and on and on. So we just Ho need hopefully to... not, hopefully not. Yeah, I know. We'll see. <laughs> I don't want any longer of lockdown. No, longer. because we just need to get we just need to get the number up so we can at least be free, have some you know a bit more freedoms, and you know get yes. out of town. <laughs> yes, yes, for sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that, that's something. And then we try to, um, in our program, uh, for those who are watching now, if you are, uh, as you know, we have come, uh, we discuss about the vaccine from the religious perspective. We talk about from the science perspective. And obviously, if you have any questions, you know, uh, you're most welcome to um, uh, yeah, contact us, email us, and we'll, uh, we'll pass the message or we'll pass the question uh, to someone else who knows. 
Um, I think the other day someone asked me to get a data sheet about Pfizer. I emailed Pfizer and I think within 48 hours, they emailed me back with all the, the information about the vaccines. Um, you know, so Alhamdulillah, so, you know, it's good. And we, we're doing our best. We're just trying to be part of the society and um, and get rich at 90%, the magic number, they said. Yes. Um, yes. Hopefully, oh, we are. <laughs> <Close>. yes. <laughs> You're so close. We're almost there. Yes. Uh, it's, a, it's a long race. And... Uh, yeah, so that's from my side. Any 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 last few words, uh, Professor? That you, um, or maybe you can share why do you choose to be vaccinated from your perspective? Oh, that's all, that's that's a good question. Um, I think I really uh, feared the idea of long COVID for me um, and getting seriously ill, but also um, absolutely feel that I want to protect the community and those that are probably more vulnerable than me. So it was really it was really a two pronged. Uh, reason to do it and and I'm lucky I've been able to see the, the you know the data up close and personal so I had even though I'm terrified of needles which it's true um <laughs> I, I did feel a lot of confidence this time <laughs> and felt like a, it was quite cathartic actually being able to get the vaccine so yeah and it's it's so important that people have the opportunity to have their questions answered um you know to their satisfaction too um, and, and if we have extra question, uh, Professor, we might actually just email you and you can reply to us and we can put it on our Facebook. Uh, for answer. Is that okay with you? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. I think we are coming to an end. Muhammad Thompson, I'll let you close the program, inshallah. Just last few yep. words from you. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say we're so fortunate in New Zealand. Um, you know, we have a good health system. We have a good, you know, um, area of where we can get, you know, we've got experts here and things like that. And we don't have to pay for any of these things, you know, you, um, the vaccinations, the, the uh, testing and everything like this. Some countries, real poor countries, they can't, you know, they have to pay for the vaccination, they have to pay for everything. And, you know, they're the ones that least can afford it. So we have to be thankful that, you know, we're living in a country like this and uh, be grateful, you know, that we are. And, and, you know, we haven't suffered a real lot. Yes, in Auckland, we've been in lockdown for so long, but other places like a family in Melbourne, Melbourne were locked down for, you know, something like 200 days and things like that. So, and other areas where they, they having a lot of problem, you know, we've had little um, deaths, which is good with, uh, which even one is too many, but, you know, a small amount compared per head of population compared to other areas and infection rates are, you know, still quite low compared to a lot of areas. So we still, you know, we've worked hard, the whole country's worked hard. So we just need to, you know, keep working hard together as one, um, you know, for the sake of each other. We, you know, we're one community, uh, might have different colours, different accents and things like that, um, but we're still, you know, one team of five million, as, uh, you know, the Prime Minister has said many times. So we just need to work together. Um, and thanks for watching and stay safe and uh, hopefully get to 90% soon. Inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for watching. And uh, the, all this video will be available on the Facebook and on the YouTube as well. Uh, thank you.